while, while everybody is getting settled, I'll tell you a little story. Those who are not talking, they will hear the story, otherwise that's fine. One of my mentors in Toronto insisted that I should start memorizing Bible verses. Now, this is something you should know about me. I am very bad at memorizing anything. <laughs> this is why I took math in my school and university level. And also, I didn't have the privilege to go to Sunday school as a kid. So these are certain things you should do when you're a kid. When you're older, then it's so difficult to memorize uh, Bible verses or anything for that matter, especially when English is not your first language, adding to that trouble, right? But he insisted, and he picked the verse for me, and he said, I want you to memorize these verses in one week. Um, so this is the first verse, uh, verses, set of verses I have memorized as a 30-something-year-old, you know. I'm trying to say that I hope I will not mess up. Uh, if not, if <laughs> it will still be here. It is from NASB version uh, of uh, NASB 1995 version. And as I say this, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. Now I, I say this, it gives me chills because I didn't know why he picked that verse. I didn't pick this verse. He picked that verse. And now I realize at this moment, I realize why I was learning this verse. Okay? So when I recite this verse, don't just listen to this as Paul's words to the church at Corinth, but Pastor Matthew's words to Lake Avenue Church. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in fear, in weakness, and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in the demonstration of spirit and of power, so that your faith would stand not on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Every single time I step into any pulpit, I say the second verse to, my, to, to me. You know, I, I say that to myself. I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I have been, I have been in this church for 10 years, 10 years coming this October. I was sitting there in that pew for seven years. Nobody knew me. I was a member like you. I had this perspective from the pew to the pulpit. Then the last three years, I was a pastor. I had this view from the pew to the pulpit. I know you. <laughs> I know many of you. I know your politics. I know your biases. I know your thinking. But each time I step into the pulpit, I make a conscious decision that I determine to know nothing. It's a conscious decision you make. I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. <laughs> 2012, when I came to Pasadena for the, for the only reason of doing my PhD program at Fuller, in the three years I was in, 
they forced me to read around 400 books, which I didn't want to read. <laughs> <laughs> books on theology, anthropology, film studies, culture, every single thing under the planet. And all these 400 books, I accumulated so much knowledge and wisdom, and my temptation, again, each time I step into the pulpit to dazzle you with the knowledge I have about the culture, about politics, about movies, about many, many things. But Jesus tells me every single time, the Holy Spirit whispers into my ear, Matthew, don't you dare. Don't you dare. I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that is the only reason we are here. This is the only thing that unites us. This is the story that brings us together. There was a time Bible used to unite us, but now the Bible can be swung left, right, whichever leaning you have. And unfortunately, we live in such a chaotic culture, even the Bible itself cannot unite us. But this, right here, the fact that God sent his only begotten son so that whoever believeth in him will not perish, but will have an everlasting life. And that, by the way, was the second verse I memorized. <laughs> and here, and we are going to drink to this, and I'm going to ask you, just this is the first time, would you stand with me as we partake from the communion just to show the reverence to the crucified Christ who is the only one's name we will revere, we will lift up, nothing else from this platform. That's my promise to you. Here is the broken body of Christ. Let us partake from this together. Here is the shed blood of Christ, the symbol of the new covenant. Let's drink from this together. Remain standing as I'm going to read from the scripture. It is only one verse today. There is only one verse. This comes again from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? This is the word of the Lord, and you may be seated. Amen. Almost 25 years ago, actually the exact date is 1997, April 23rd, I was invited to a small youth gathering in a church in India. I was there to judge a competition among the young people. A small gathering in, 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 uh, in India is, we are talking about hundreds of young, young, young people, youth. And they had this very unique competition which I haven't seen anywhere else. It is actually called extemporizing, which is like a speaking competition, but the subject of, or the topic of the, the talk will be given only five minutes before the candidate steps into the stage. So before they go to speak, they will be taken to a room, they will be given, this is the topic you are going to speak, and they have five minutes to prepare whatever they have to say. So it was kind of, and I, I'm judging this competition among two other judges. So it was really fascinating to watch these young people fumble through stuff and they have no idea what they are talking about. It's almost comical, right? <laughs> So then comes a 19-year-old young girl, and she came and she articulated her thoughts very succinctly. I was to the point, I remember I gave the maximum available mark to that young girl. 
And the first thing, the first thought that crossed my mind was, my goodness, if I could marry her. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Sort of, sort of, yeah. <laughs> 25 years later, now that young girl has other two young girls like her, and she is the CFO of Cal Poly Pomona uh, Foundation. And I, yes, I did marry her. <laughs> 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 five minutes ago, I asked her, can you preach this sermon for me? That's all she needs, five minutes, right? <laughs> no, this is 25 years in the making. It's my privilege to introduce you to my wife, Joanne, and she will be taking from here for the first half of the sermon. <laughs> morning. Thank you. And Matthew has no idea what I'm going to say. <laughs> now, I should be honest, I had a little more than five minutes, so it's not quite extemporizing. Um, and uh, bear with me. So the verse for today um, is, do you not know that you are a temple of God? and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Like I said, I had a little more time to think about this, so um, as I was meditating on this verse and, and, and thinking about exactly what temple means through the Bible, it's, um, it, I'm only supposed to talk for five minutes, but I was spending hours <laughs> just, just um, going through what the Bible says about the temple, and it's fascinating. In the Old Testament, it starts off with um, the tabernacle and the cloud of God coming down and being present in the tabernacle, a cloud by day, fire by night, goes to uh, the actual temple that Solomon built, and then we move on through the years and centuries to the New Testament, and everything changed. All of a sudden, well, we all know, our Lord Jesus Christ came down to the earth. He sacrificed himself on the cross, and the temple was not a building anymore. It became much more personal. It became us. God brought it, brought the temple out of this, this space, a building with rooms, boundaries, walls, and made it a part of us. It, it was striking for me as I went through this. So just to, just to bring, keeping in mind that, that I don't take too long, I thought I would just bring this full circle and ask you to do a small exercise with me. I want you all to picture your silhouette yourselves right in front of you, and it's a silhouette. And the second part of this verse says, the Spirit of God dwells in you. I want you to picture that. The Spirit of God as a light that's shining out from the inside out. You have the silhouette and you have this bright light that's shining out from there. And then there's one other very important element. And that is, well, if you look around you, I mean, I think I have the best view in the house right now. <laughs> if you look around you, it's the people, the most important element here. And just to, you know, just to give you a little background into the way I perceive this, I grew up in the, in the Middle East. And I say that because I grew up with uh, a mentality, more of the East than of the West, uh, where certain things are perceived pretty dif differently from how we see it here in the West. 
And the biggest example that I can give you that relates to this is, um, is my childhood home. My parents were always used to having um, someone knock on the door, ring the doorbell at all hours of, of the day or night just to come and chat and spend some time with, with them. And, uh, and they would never leave without being fed. They left with their stomachs full. And this was normal for me to see. Uh, it was uh, a little unusual in the fact that my mom would even do uh, lunches and dinners for groups of people in the, in, uh, almost in the hundreds, and she would be the one doing all the, all the cooking uh, for this group. So I grew up seeing people a lot. I grew up being part of the church a lot. And in seeing people, I grew up to understand that it's, there's great joy in people. There's great joy in being a part of another's experience, another's life, and there's so much to learn. So with that in mind, I want you to help, I want to help you finish this picture. You have the silhouette, you have the light of God, the Holy Spirit shining out from the inside, and you have people. Being the temple of God, and I had to write this down so I don't get this wrong, so <laughs> forgive me as I look at my sheet. Being the temple of God is to have the Holy Spirit within us and have his people among us. The Lord said in the Old Testament, my dwelling place also will be with them and I will be their God and they will be my people. That same portion is referenced uh, not in this verse that we just read, but in the second book, in the second letter of, uh, to the Corinthians, and it starts off with, for we are the temple of God. And it says, and God says, my dwelling place also will be with them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. So picture the silhouette. The more and more we do this, the greater the light shines. And the more people that we bring in, even greater this light shines. And as the light grows, here's the, here's the best part of this. As the light grows and increases, I hope you're seeing this in your, in your mental pictures, the silhouette starts to disappear. It becomes all about God and all about his people. He must increase and I must decrease. Thank you. Jesus uh, told the Samaritan woman, an hour is coming when you will, not, you will not worship the Father in this mountain or in Jerusalem, but the true worshipers will worship the Father in truth and spirit. Now, as Joanne said, there is this understanding, particularly among the Jewish people, that the presence of God was confined to a specific time and specific place that was in the temple of Jerusalem. You know this, right? The Jewish people had synagogues all across, as they have even today. But synagogues were meant to be the gathering places. That's where community formed. But the actual presence of God is available, even though God is this omnipresent God, the actual presence of God is in specific place and in specific time that was in the temple, Jerusalem. Then there, was, there were Samaritans who were the rival group, kind of Jews but mixed race. 
So they were upset about the fact that Jews had the monopoly of the presence of God. So they built approximately around 450 BC another temple, parallel temple in Shechem on top of Mount Gerizim. This was the Samaritan temple. And they said, no, the presence of God is not there. The true worshipers not, will not have to, or they don't go to Jerusalem temple, but they should come to here. This is the temple and on top of Mount Gerizim. Then one of the Jewish kings, around 110 BC, before Jesus, and he was so angry, he went and destroyed the whole Samaritan temple. So at the time when Jesus was speaking to Samaritan woman, the Samaritans did not have a temple, only the ruins of what once was a temple on top of this mountain, but the Samaritans still insisted that true worshipers should worship not in Jerusalem, but in this mountain. So there was this big dispute between the Jews and the Samaritans about where should you worship, in the mount, on, the, on top of this mountain, which is Mount Gerizim, or in Jerusalem. And Jesus came and he reframed the whole paradigm of worship. And he said, the true worshipers don't have to go to that mountain or this Jerusalem, but they will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Jesus introduced a new kind of worship in spirit that demand a new form of temple that can contain and animated by the spirit. The problem with the physical building is that it cannot contain a spirit. The spirit cannot animate physical objects. The spirit can animate only a body an organic thing. See, that's why it is out of a theological necessity that the New Testament re-envisioned church as you and I, because we are the only two things, or in the, you know, we human beings are the only, only beings that can be animated by the Holy Spirit. And if we learned anything from the pandemic, we realized that. We thought Lake Avenue Church is the temple and this beautiful building is the temple. But during COVID, this, this facility had to be shut down. But church didn't stop. You witnessed it. I witnessed it. Church was functioning in backyards. And honestly, the last two years of my life here at Lake Avenue Church was busier than before because the church was very much active. And I got to be part of it because the Holy Spirit, which cannot be contained in this physical building, went out and animated you and I and continued the mission of the church, which is exactly what we heard. This is a new kind of temple. This is a new kind of worship. That's why I titled the sermon, We are the walking temples of God. We are meant to be the bodies. We are meant to be the temples animated by the Spirit so that we can carry the mission of the Lord to our neighborhood, to our offices, to our colleges, wherever we go. And that's how in the Old Testament that we people went to the temple, but in the New Testament, the temple goes to the people. Temple goes to the people. And it just reversed. Jesus came and reversed the structure of worship. Now what does it mean to be animated by the Holy Spirit? And I'm not going to talk about this right now. We don't have, a, we don't have time. So I'm going to use, just like my wife did, I'm going to give you a visual picture. What it is to be, you know, because the Holy Spirit can be a very controversial topic. You know, what, is, what do you mean by animated by the Holy Spirit? It's very good to hear all these things. So what does that mean? So let me give you a visual picture. I don't know, have you heard about this phenomenon called murmuration? Murmuration, okay, I'll explain. Murmuration is this process, or you know, better explained as a phenomenon. A certain kind of birds, instead of flying in flocks, 
they almost fly together in a choreographed formation in the sky. It's almost like a sky dance, like synchronized motions of this, you know, the, you know they will be dancing in the sky. And they will be wheeling and darting in the sky like, a, like you know, somebody is really, like a, like a conductor is kind of organizing this. It's a, form, it's a form of, they have some kind of a collective thinking. And they are somehow communicating to each other precise movements and at every single time. And many scientists in MIT and Princeton, if you want, you can go home and Google murmuration. There are so many scientific papers have been, you know, are written on it. The scientists have, are trying to study this phenomenon using uh, computer simulation techniques and algorithms they create just to see multiple cameras used because they still don't know how this happens. They thought there is a supreme leader who is giving you know, signal to other birds, but they cannot see any physical signal. They cannot see any, any even body heat, and they're trying to, I mean, it's very interesting to read scientific papers about how the birds fly, you know, by Princeton and MIT graduate, right? But because they, 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 they think, and they're right, if we could figure out how these birds achieve this collective thinking, we could save the world, which is true, which is true. But they can't. They can't. All they can say is there is something telepathic going on to, for, to do this formation. And in so many ways, being with the Holy Spirit or being animated by the Holy Spirit is almost like murmuration. It is a telepathic signal which comes from elsewhere. And if you are going to look at the senior pastor as the next new Messiah, now that is the problem with the whole Western church. Because we are looking at this particular hero for some kind of signal. No, that's not how murmuration works. It has to come from elsewhere. The job of a senior pastor or any pastor is to somehow channel that for the rest of the congregation. The signal yet has to come from elsewhere. And that's what transforms, that's what gets us into that synchronized movement, that, that cloud, the moving cloud of the choreographed cloud of the birds and how they float. And that is exactly what happens when the Holy Spirit animate our, animates our congregation. And that's exactly my prayer for Lake Avenue Church. And this can happen in real life to real people. And this is not just some visual picture. I have seen this in motion many, many times. And the off late, the latest time I witnessed this was just last month or a couple months ago. And I'm going to talk some about, something about the search committee, okay? <laughs> search committee is officially disbanded, so I think I can make jokes about him, them right now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm not going to go into the details, but, <laughs> you know, when the search committee invited me to have this conversation, and I remember going there, and there were 15 people, you know. I'm not intimidated by any interview. I've been interviewed by big corporation, big corporation, multinational companies in four different countries. Interviews don't intimidate me. But we, I've never been interviewed by 15 people at the same time. And all of them I know very well, <laughs> okay? And I know that 15 members of the same family won't agree on anything. Uh, actually, even four members of our family cannot agree on which picture we had to show here, right? You know, that happens. <laughs> that happens. So I'm, I'm sitting there, so they invited me, and my first instinct was, you know, just, and, and, uh, and they asked me this very, a politically charged question, what is my view on abortion? What is my view on human sexuality? And this was no simple game, my dear. I mean, I worked hard for this position, by the way. You know, there were four or, four or five serious interviews on very, very, you know, social justice versus biblical justice. All these questions are being asked. There are 15 people around me, and I know them very well, and, and I know how they're thinking. I know some of them are in the extreme right wing of the political spectrum, extreme left wing of the political spectrum, and I'm thinking, oh my goodness, normally when I talk, I need to, 
assume a person. I need to talk to a person. I cannot talk to like, you know, 15 people at the same time. So I, I, who should I speak to? Because if I answer to this person, I know, you know, if I give one answer, there will be five other red flags going on on the other side. I was just confusing. And then, so I'm sitting there confused. Not that I don't have an answer. I wanted to say I will not manipulate anything. I wanted to say what I wanted to say, but I don't know where to look. That's my problem, right? You got 15 people. <laughs> so then I realized that, so this meeting, you know, this interview was happening in a secret location, by the way. They didn't do it here because it was completely secret. Uh, in somebody's home, now I can reveal it. There was the casting home. Uh, you know, <laughs> there was a, it, their backyard. They were a beautiful backyard. Uh, and we were sitting in the backyard and uh, 15 chairs are earned. And then I saw that they have a cement slab uh, just by their deck. And on top of you know, that, we have the chairs and we're sitting. Suddenly, I looked at the middle. There is this one slab with a picture on it. I hope we have that picture. Yes. Um, so it's a, <laughs> it's a plain cement slab and this one picture right in the middle. And they are all sitting around this. And this is what in the middle. And obviously, that's a dove. And that's a bird, obviously. And uh, if you know anything about the Lois Caston and Dick Caston, their family, and that's, the, that's what they live by, the Holy Spirit guidance, right? That, that backyard is soaked in prayer. I knew that. That was my confidence going there, too. And I looked at it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Now I know what to say. And I looked to, during the entire time of my, that interview. I looked at that one image. I looked at the one image. I knew the Holy Spirit is present here. I knew the murmuration is about to happen. I knew the transcendent signal is being telecasted. It's all what I need to do is just to carry the signal and transmit it. I didn't hear what they were asking, but I was preaching. Whether they liked it or not, they had to hear what, what. So they were asking me something. I don't know. I'm just saying that this is what it is. And I'm going to, I was, I remember that moment. I could literally, literally sense a kind of murmuration. And suddenly, you know, like I said, you know, it was kind of, first when I went there, I was like being invited to, invited as a guest to the Thanksgiving dinner of a, of a dysfunctional family, kind of, you know, that's why, you know, you have Uncle Bob on one side, the Aunt Daisy on the other side, shouting and screaming, you know, but no, that's not what happened. But generally, you know what I mean? I can make jokes. They, are not, they don't exist anymore, right? So, yeah, so, so what I'm saying is suddenly there was something transformed, something happened. And in the end, when, when they announced the decision and Ella came to, talked to me about the decision to my house, and, and then she, uh, she, she, she said, you know, this is our decision. And they, they said the, their decision was unanimous. I didn't, hear, I, didn't hear, I didn't hear the yes or no part, because if their decision was a unanimous no, I would have been equally happy, because anything to come out of that committee unanimous, that itself was a miracle. You know, that itself was a miracle. A, a, a unanimous no would, be, would have been just as big a miracle as it was a unanimous yes. And then I got one more picture of their final decision making. They sent this, this picture. And I was not there at that, when that picture was taken. You can see that the entire uh, circle of, of search committee. And right in the middle, right in the middle is that slab you see. The symbol of the Holy Spirit. And that's where I believe the murmuration happened. All I can tell you, my brothers and sisters, you know, I can preach about unity all you want. I can write books about it. I can teach classes about it. But unless we learn to dance in the rhythm of the Holy Spirit, Nobody can bring unity to this church or to the world anywhere else unless we learn to dance in the rhythm of the Holy Spirit. I don't want you to lose your ideas. I want Republicans to stay as Republicans. I want Democrats to stay as Democrats. I don't care what your political leanings are, but when you come here, I want you to keep the difference but learn to dance. Learn to dance. And that's how the murmuration happens. And that's my message to you. And that's how we become the temple of God because the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit dwells in us. 
Once again, I want you to know that please don't look to any, any leaders because I am going to disappoint you. It's only a matter of time. It's only a matter of time. I, yeah, I mean, I'm, I know that. I'm not being humble. I'm just using my common sense. It's just a common sense decision, uh, uh, opinion to say that. But always remember the murmuration. That murmuration can happen when you let the Holy Spirit animate you. And that's when we bring unity, and that's when we bring oneness. Let us learn to dance again. No trust, don't trust in the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. I'm going to ask the, ask the uh, worship team to come forward and lead us in a song. And when we are going to sing, when we are singing, I want you to look at the screen. And it is a very old song, but apparently we haven't sung this before. It starts by saying, Holy Spirit, rain down. And I want that to be a prayer for all of us. And would you stand with me as we sing that song? That, that's a prayer. That's our prayer. Holy Spirit, rain down, rain down, oh, comforter and friend, how we need your touch again, Holy Spirit, rain down, rain down, let your power fall, let your voice be heard, come and change our hearts as we stand on your word, Holy Spirit, rain. Let's sing that again, church. Holy Spirit, rain down. Rain, rain down. Oh, comforter and friend. How we need your touch again. Holy Spirit,
God, today, today is the day that we surrender completely to you and we let go of our control. We let go of our pride of being this church of 125 years of rich tradition and heritage as great as it is. We realize that at this point in time, no human beings or no human ideologies can save us today. So Lord, we are here completely willing to learn to dance, irrespective of our differences, irrespective of our theological convictions on one side or the other side, irrespective of our political leaning, we are here to dance. The Spirit of God, would you teach us murmuration so that people will look at this church and say, what is happening there? It is not because of one particular person or not because of the ministry council or not because of this one committee. What is happening? They are receiving some kind of telepathic signal from the transcendent realm and we are learning to dance with the Holy Spirit. Lord, let that be, let that be the testament, that would be the witness of Lake Avenue Church for the next 125 years. So that 125 years from now, if our kids and kids, little kids, and they look up to us and they say, that's our heritage, that's what our, our forefathers gave it to us, and the gift of learning to dance with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I want to take a quick minute to say thank you for joining me in this battle for the soul of our community, our Pasadena, and our family in particular, and, and Joanne, and you, I mean, you can only imagine how hard it is for a spouse to be part of this process, and both our daughters, Hannah and Emma, have been such helpful mentors in so many ways, giving their perspective, and this guy who's standing with Emma, his name is David Silagi, and we just hired him as a bodyguard for our daughter. No. <laughs> <laughs> The entire Zilagi family, and if you don't know them, you should get to know them. They have become like our family, and they have been such a prayer support and such constant, uh, our, our immediate family here. So thank you, all of you, and now we have this extended family. And please continue to pray for us. Our job has just begun, and this is not a time to stop praying, but this is the time to start praying, okay? Now, um, I want you to say, to do something. This is kind of part of the benediction. Um, what, I'm going to summarize my sermon in two uh, words, two sentences. I want you to say this with me, okay? The first one is a dedication that I am the temple of God. I am the temple of God, right? Because that's what we heard. You are the temple of God. And the second one is the commitment that I will be led by the Holy Spirit. 
Okay? I don't want you just to hear a good sermon. It was a good sermon or a bad sermon. No, I want you to own it. Okay? So you're going to repeat with me as I'm going to say this. I am the temple of God. I will be led by the Holy Spirit. One more time. This is good. <laughs> I am the temple of God. I will be led by the Holy Spirit. There is something about pastor, they make you uh, say things three times, you know that, right? So I'm going to do that. <laughs> One more time, the third time, really, this is your last chance to say it, okay? <laughs> I am the temple of God. I will be led by the Holy Spirit. Now as you leave, May you become walking tumbles in your neighborhood and all over the world you carry the presence of God. May you learn to dance with God in the rhythm of the Holy Spirit. And may your faith would rest